Thank you everyone for coming along to this quick bites event as part of Innovation Week. This is an unusual event in that it's actually a partnership between um, the library and who have invited me to come along and speak as well. My name is Anna Noonan. I'm the Business Development Manager for the Arts and Social Sciences, um, the Con and Law, and I work for the Research Portfolio. <coughs> and this is Emma Petherbridge, who is the, um, what's your title? Uh, academic Liaison Librarian for the Business Group. So together over the next half an hour, we're going to talk through just some, some of the key ideas and um, ha the how-tos to kick-starting collaborative research <coughs> partnerships with a specific focus on the arts and social sciences. But before we begin, just to get a sense of who's in the room, um, do we have any PhD students here? Fantastic. Any postdocs? <coughs> any early career researchers? Any mid-career researchers? Any professors in the room? Okay, well welcome everybody. Hopefully that the um, information that you hear today will be useful for everyone, no matter where you are on your career path. So, by way of introduction, you probably are getting a sense that external engagement is definitely a new buzzword within the university environment. Lots of people are talking about it, a lot of positions are being appointed within the university. What does this actually mean and what does this mean for academic researchers? How do, what, what's in it for researchers and how is it different to the way in which research has been traditionally conceived um, as, as part of university work? So the reason why it's important to the university, as you will have seen, because I know everyone's read the university's strategic plan 2016 to 2020, research excellence is one of the key strategic themes and within that is, this, is strategy three. Engage in partnerships to enable our research to make a difference locally and globally. So what we're seeing as part of the university's vision in this space is a real shift towards the traditional ideas or traditional research environments. If you think more practically about the ways in which academic research can translate beyond the academy, we kind of jump over that academic journal paywall. So what does it actually mean? What does this research mean for the real world? And how can we make sure that our research is, is excellent and also responding to the needs and challenges of today's society. So that's kind of the broad framing of the way in which the university sees external engagement. It's about working in partnership with people beyond the academy, so beyond research institutions themselves, to try and map out some of these, um, the world's biggest <coughs> challenges and problems. So why is it important for you as a researcher? Right, that's the university's strategic vision, but you as a researcher and as an academic. And there are a number of things that I think that are really important to consider. The first thing is that all researchers are being encouraged to develop a really diverse research portfolio for themselves. So that might include blue sky research, the kind of traditional research that you might have always imagined doing at university, as well as this more applied research where you're actually working in partnership with others who are not necessarily researchers themselves. Why is that important? Look, it's important for a number of reasons. The first is finding new collaborators brings new ideas. So what's available within the academy in terms of um, critical thinking and problem solving has its certain limits, but actually working in partnership with the people that live and breathe the kind of problems that you're working in um, can bring about new ideas as well. Some disciplines within arts and social <coughs> sciences lend themselves very closely to this, but others not so much. So we're encouraging definitely the idea of working in partnership with people beyond, beyond the academy. The other reason, which is a bit of a more serious reason, is that we're seeing a significant decline in research income coming from the Australian Research Council. So there's actually an advantage for you as a researcher to be on the front foot in terms of this space, to be looking at new ways to find funding for your own research. And that comes through some of these research collaboration partnerships. There are a number of schemes now, some, some funded by the federal government, some others, where funding is provided specifically for research that involves an academic partner and an external partner. So it's in your interest as a researcher to be thinking outside the box in terms of that as well, in terms of building up your own profile and particularly um, sourcing funding for research for yourself. And so I'm gonna shortly pass over to Emma, but I think what's important to note is the university is investing quite a lot of time and money and, and person power to support you in this process. So just in this room, you have, I'm a representative from the research portfolio, so the central research portfolio, Emma's from the library, and of course, each faculty has its own research team led by their associate dean research and research manager. So we're all here to support you through this process. So I think one of the big questions that I get 
He says, okay, so the university wants me to do this. This is good for me, this is good for my career, and it's good for the university. How on earth do I start? And so here's just a snapshot of all different kinds of organisations that you might actually be able to work with. You might actually have ideas already in terms of your research and who's most interested in it. But just have a look, cast your eyes down the list of all the different groupings there. They're grouped for a particular reason, which if we have time at the end I can speak in more detail about. But to think broadly, to think that, so to give you some examples, people in arts and social sciences are working with virtual reality and engagement with orangutans, are working on food insecurity in inner city environments with major supermarkets, working with the Department of Education on machine learning for young people. So a really diverse range of commercial and non-commercial organisations. So keep an open mind about who you might work with. It might not be the people as closely aligned to your discipline as you might think. Hi everyone, thanks for your time today. Um, my name's Emma Peckerbridge and I'm an academic liaison librarian for the Business School. I'm going to briefly talk to you about some of the key library resources that can help you to learn more about a particular sector, for example, museums and art galleries, find organisations within a sector, and finally, where to find more information about an organisation that could be your potential next research partner. So where to start? All of the resources that I'll mention today are linked to via the library's public sector and not-for-profits research guide. As you can see, it's part of a broader guide on company and industry research. Page one of your handout contains step-by-step -step instructions on how to access this guide via the library's website. Anna has mentioned some of the different types of organisations that you can partner with. Before you target a specific organisation, I'd recommend that you conduct some background research on the broader sector or industry in which they operate. This could include identifying key stakeholders, recent developments, as well as any major issues and challenges. The more you know about an organisation's external environment, the better placed you'll be to understand your research partner and spot opportunities for further research. Page three of your handout contains a list of databases and websites that can help you to learn more about a particular sector. So let's take a look at some of these resources. IBISWorld is a leading database for Australian industry research. Over 700 industry reports are available. You can either search for the name of a relevant sector, for example, museums, or click on the industry reports link to browse through a list of reports uh, that are available through the database. IBISWorld's reports cover a broad range of public, cultural, and not-for-profit services. Here's a list of some of the reports that are available via the database. But wait, there's even more. There's some on healthcare and arts and recreation services. So I definitely recommend that you check, uh, check out IBISWorld. IBISWorld's industry reports provide information on a sector's performance, including key external drivers, the competitive landscape, major companies, operating conditions, and key statistics. Our next database is Factiva. Factiva lets you search across an archive of all major Australian newspapers and newspapers from around the world. News articles often highlight significant developments, trends and issues within different industries and sectors. As an example, if I wanted to learn more about the aged care sector, I could search for either maybe aged care or nursing homes across major Australian sources such as the AFR, the Australian and the Sydney Morning Herald. You can then export your list of results into either Word or PDF. And while I'm talking about news articles, I'll also mention that the library has a subscription to AFR.com and the Sydney Morning Herald website. So that means that you can access all of their articles for free um, via the library databases page. The library's uh, research guide also lists a range of free websites that you can use to learn more about, um, that you can use to learn more about NGOs and community organisations. Um, third sector on the left um, provides news on Australian charities, not-for-profits, and community groups. Uh, you also have the option to subscribe to a free weekly newsletter. Pro Bono Australia produce a twice weekly news alert on charities and the not-for-profit not sector. Government websites can also be a useful source of information about different sectors and industries. As part of your research process, I'd recommend that you start by answering two questions. 
First, is a particular agency or department responsible for your sector or industry? And secondly, has there been a parliamentary inquiry into your sector or industry? Google's site search function can help you to find the answer to these questions. To limit your search to Australian government sites, just enter your search terms followed by site colon .gov.au. You can also run a similar search across the Australian Parliament House website. Here's an example of a search I ran across the Parliament House website for any mention of video games. This led me to discover that the Senate has undertaken inquiry into the future of Australia's video game development industry. And from the inquiry page, I'd highly recommend that you check out the submissions and the final report, um, as they often give you some insight into the key stakeholders and issues and challenges involved in the sector. We'll now move on to how to find organisations within a particular sector. And so this is covered on page four of your handout. On the screen, I've listed a few key databases and websites that can help you to find NGOs, community groups and associations. As you can see, the coverage of each database varies considerably. Company 360 covers the top 50,000 companies in Australia. However, don't be put off by the word company. The database includes major NGOs, cultural organisations, providers of social services and professional associations. You can use the site's advanced search page to build a list of organisations based on various criteria, including location and industry. If you want to build a list of organisations in a particular <coughs> sector, it's best to use Company 360's industry classification codes. On the screen, I've listed some of the main codes assigned to community organisations and not-for-profits. Uh, so the main areas are social services, museums, art galleries, botanical gardens and zoological gardens as well as membership organisations. The Directory of Australian Associations covers over 3,500 associations across a broad range of areas, including arts, the community, uh, history and heritage, the environment and law. You can use the site's advanced search page to search for associations that fall into a particular category. So each major category is broken down into a series of subcategories. For instance, community is broken down into senior citizens, human rights, charitable organisations, and so on. As an example, here are some of the 26 youth organisations listed in the directory. When you click on an item, you're then presented with a basic snapshot of the organisation and a link to its website and contact details. Iberswog covers the top 2,000 companies in Australia and New Zealand. This includes over 300 government and public sector institutions. You can develop a list of organisations via Iberswell's Company Wizard tool. You can use the left-hand side of the page to build a list of companies within a particular industry or sector. If you want to limit your search to government bodies, you can do so via the company type menu on the left-hand side of the page. There are also several free sites that can help you to identify organisations within a particular sector. A list of these sites can be found via our library guide. And the sites are grouped under four major category areas, being NGOs and community organisations, international aid and development, cultural organisations such as art galleries, museums, and so on, and as well as government departments and agencies. A really useful site is the Register of Charities maintained by the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. It contains information on over 54,000 registered charities and not-for-profits. You can also use the advanced search tab to build a list of charities based on their location, purpose and who they help. As an example, here's a search for charities based in, or not-for-profits based in New South Wales that support migrants, refugees or asylum seekers. And this is what the list of results would look like. You also have the option to further filter your results by postcode and um, status. So once you've identified a potential research partner, where can you learn more about the organisation? I've listed a range of sources on page five of your handout. Ibisworld uh, contains profile reports on the top 2,000 companies in Australia and New Zealand by revenue. This includes over 250 government bodies and large charities such as the Smith Family, World Vision, Mission Australia and Diabetes Australia. Ibisworld's profile reports generally include a list of key personnel, uh, as well as financial data and information about the organisation's history and background. 
Company 360 covers the top 50,000 companies in Australia. As I mentioned before, this includes major cult cultural organisations, not-for-profits and professional associations. Here's an example of a profile in Oxfam. You can use the right here menu to access more detailed information, including an overview of Oxfam's operations, key personnel and financials going back 10 years. If you're looking at a charity or other not-for-profit, I'd recommend that you also check out the ACNT register. As an example, if you search for the Fred Hollows Foundation, you can access information, uh, including a summary of where they operate, a list of key personnel, as well as an archive of annual financial reports and information statements. I'd also recommend that you use Factiva to search for mentions of your target organisation in the press. I'd also recommend that you find out where the organisation or if it, has an, if it has a presence on social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. The organisation's social media posts can often provide an easy and free way to keep up to date with new developments. They can also provide an insight into what the organisation cares about and who they engage with. An obvious option would also be to check the organisation's website. I'd recommend that you look out for an About Us or What We Do page, annual reports, recent press releases, as well as in any information about the organisation's strategy and vision. Um, some government departments and agencies even include information about research partnerships on their website. Um, so I hope you're now across some of the key resources that can help you to learn more about potential research partners. If you have any further questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact the librarian for your faculty or discipline. To access your librarian's contact details, you just need to go to the library website and click on the Meet with the Librarian button at the top right of the page. So I'll now hand you back to Anna, who will share some tips about how to interact with potential research partners. All right, so as you can see, there's a wealth of resources available within the university, including subscriptions to these enormous databases where you can start to get a really good sense of who are the major players in the area that you want to do research with, um, what do they look like as organisations, and who, this, who the key people might be within, your organi within those organisations. One thing we don't recommend you do is to ring up that organisation and say, hi, I'm a PhD student from the University of Sydney and I've got some really great research that I'd like to share with you because you might be the 15th researcher that's contacted them that day. So there's actually a bit of strategic um, thinking behind the way in which you engage with your research partners. And that's about, you know, some people find this easier than others, but it's about basic networking. So up, you can, up here you can see on the map, the internet animation there, uh, the colourful map here, that there are actually ways in which you can build relationships with research partners um, through your regular academic work. This might include teaching guest guest lectures, it might be talking to the people in alumni and development in your faculty to find out that there may be in fact alumni working within an organisation that you'd like to partner with. It could also be that there are events happening on campus where people from that particular organisation are coming along to, including Sydney Ideas. It could be that we've also had a long history of research partnerships with that specific organisation. So for example, the City of Sydney, we have a long standing history of research with the City of Sydney in different parts different projects, different parts of the City of Sydney's organisational structure. So to have a bit of a sense that when you're turning up that you also know about the university's history of relationship with that particular organisation. Chatting to colleagues and others in your specific disciplinary field can also be really helpful because as this is a big push from the university, lots of people are looking to engage with the same kinds of organisations and the best way that we can do this is not by having five people from the same department contact the same person at the organisation with their specific research ideas, but actually to come up with a bit of a strategy. What can we offer that particular organisation as a collective rather than on these individual project levels? And don't forget about your personal contacts. You might actually know someone who works in that specific organisation who might not be the right person to talk to, but who you can ask. Who is the person that has, makes the decisions about whether or not research partnerships can happen and on what particular theme? Can they give you some strategic advice about where to reach within the organisation? It's one of those tricky things to manage and it's partly what um, the role of a business development manager can assist you with, is to not go to the CEO, obviously, but also if you're talking to someone who's at relatively um, grassroots or ground level within the organisation, 
They might be really interested in your research ideas, but they might be the person setting the strategic priorities for that organisation. So trying to work out who to, who, who to best speak to about moving the partnership forward. Oh, there's the image. So this is one of the things that we work with a lot with researchers within the university. And it's tips about for talking to potential partners. So you've done your research, you know the sector, you've narrowed down on an organisation or a bunch of organisations, you found the right contact person and met them at an event and, and st started up a conversation. What next? And it's a tricky one because a lot of the work of university academics is about standing out the front and being the expert, right? Teaching students and developing your research and your area of expertise. The trickiness about these kinds of engagements is actually to take your foot off that pedal a bit. It's not about pushing your expert advice and research onto an organisation that needs it. It's actually about pausing and asking the following questions. What are the key issues for your organisation? And what's the, what are the kinds of problems or needs do you, that you need an answer to? And then stopping and listening. And waiting for that person to talk about their own organisation's needs and challenges. What keeps them awake at night? And then trying to think how your research might complement or help resolve those issues. So coming with a complete research pitch that's totally resolved, you need this for your organisation because this is going to do X, Y and Z, often doesn't begin a very fruitful research partnership because it really needs to be collaborative. So in the sales word, solution selling means actually listening for more than half of the meeting, which is something that academics and lots of people, myself included, find really hard to do. That it's actually about pausing and listening and thinking all the time about how your research can actually integrate well into their organisation's needs, challenges and problems. So this is the way that we encourage people to, to think about yourself in the relationship. Both sides have got critical thinking skills, both sides have expert knowledge, and you particularly bring the research skill. So you're an academic researcher that satisfies mutual interests and that you're actually a co collaborator, not, not a sole expert. Okay, so let's say you've had a conversation and you've listened for half the meeting and you're at the point now where you think that things might move forward, that they're interested in your research, how about we do a workshop together, maybe it can be something where the organisation come and teach us into one of your classes. How do you then start to build that into a bigger research collaboration? And what are the red flags and things that you need to look out for? So the characteristics of strong research partnerships are the strong common interest in the research and its outcomes. That you both are interested in the research, not just the outcome. That the partnerships are well established where there's actually input from both sides. So that also means looking for organisations that are not time poor, that just want you to come and do it and yeah, you can have access to our database or whatever it is that you need. That you have an active collaborator on the other side. The other thing which sounds obvious but often doesn't happen in, um, in practice is a clear research plan and agreement on all of the aspects of the engagement. And this becomes particularly important when you're thinking about things which might sound really dry and boring, but to do with intellectual property. So you might be given access to information that the organisation would like you to keep confidential or that you might be producing research that they want to then publish in their own report or whatever it might be and you might want to go on and use in your future research as well. So making sure all of those administrative kind of things about the engagement are nutted out at the very beginning is really important. And that includes talking about money. So the university encourages you always to pursue these kinds of research collaborations, thinking about how this is going to be funded. Because as I said earlier, we're seeing a significant drop in the traditional um, pots of funding for research income and looking for research collaborations that, where there's shared cost there. Other things that you don't want. Partners with lots of red tape, which is a funny one because the university is often seen as a partner with lots of red tape. So having two partners with lots of red tape just means a lot more red, red, red tape. Premature partnerships. So another tip is to really get going on a research project when you actually have had more than one or two conversations. That in fact what you really need to be doing is building a research plan together that, that you formulate together 
rather than a couple of ideas that might have happened over an industry conference dinner and then you've had one coffee afterwards. That actually getting started on those research pilot projects that build toward bigger collaborations really, really needs to be on the basis of genuine, genuine engagement, which might be things like inviting them along to a, a workshop that you're running or attending their conference or seeing if you can attend an event that they're running so that you get the sense of the way in which um, you both work in your own research or um, organisational environments. And at the bottom there, unclear or unachievable expectations within a partnership. So often we see arrangements where a partner will say, oh, I didn't realise that the researcher was going to come and spend X amount of time in our office. Or I thought we were going to get a tailored research report out of this that, that we could then publish and do whatever we wanted with. So to be really upfront about why you're involved in the research and what you're intending to do with the research as it um, outcomes, and also what they would like to do with it as well to make sure you're on the same page. And lastly, I think it's important to also understand a little bit the language, the framing language around this within the university setting. So this is actually the categories of research income as specified by the Australian Research Council. So this is now talking into the money world. This is how when you pick up a contract or you develop a research collaboration, there's of course a, usually a contract that goes with that, that sets out these expectations and how this is gonna work. And these are things for you to, have, um, to, to become familiar with. So category one, research income funding. Has anyone, has anyone seen this table before? A couple of people in the room. Okay, so this is basically telling us the way in which the government categorises all research income that higher education institu um, institutions use. This is not going to be something that you're going to live and breathe every day, but it's definitely worth thinking about in terms of understanding how the university's language frames this engagement. So the top one here is the Australian Research Council and the um, National Health and Medical Research Scheme. So these are government funded schemes, which includes the linkage scheme which is the only Australian Research Council scheme that includes partners, external partners, um, as, a, as a requirement. So that's category one. That's the traditional pot of funding that we see most research funding coming from at the moment, which is on the decline. The next four are the alternatives. So this is where there's a big push from the university and in fact from the government for us to be thinking a bit more diversely about where income is coming from. Category two is public sector income. So that is specifically from government organisations, government enterprises fund and funded bodies. So they could be through government tenders. They could also be partnerships with entities like Taronga Zoo, which as we learned earlier this week is in fact a government statutory body. So this is where you can start to see, think about where you might be able to access pots of funding, whether it be you and the partner accessing pots of funding together whether that partner actually has access to schemes that we don't have access to. So it might be that Taronga Zoo is able to find funding from the state, um, the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage that you as a researcher don't have access to. So starting to actually explore where the funding opportunities come from as well. The third one down here is industry income. So this is kind of more of your traditional commercial um, funding environment, but it does also include grants, donations, bequests and foundations. So money where money that's invested into the research taking place with outside of the government sector and outside of the traditional research sector. So we pharmaceutical companies is a great example. We owe Tinto, all the kind of dark side of commercial research you might want to include in there. But there are also a number of schemes where you can access funding, including the City of Sydney, for example, although that would be category two actually. Um, where you can source funding. The last one, or the second last one, is cooperative research centres. Now this is where you're really thinking long-term research collaborations when you've got a number of years of collaboration under your belt, and it's actually industry-led. Now industry in the broad sense, it could be public sector-led. It's where the university is a core participant, but in fact it's led by either um, a company or a cluster of companies usually. So we have, there's, I think there's one that's about to be announced on cyber security, which is a pretty interesting one, which will have, um, I don't think University of Sydney is a core partner, but we're actively involved. There are others on um, young people and mental health, which the University of Sydney has been actively involved in, where it's actually been led by industry, but we're players in that space. 
So there's enormous amount of opportunity. It's about knowing how to find your partner and then how to find the funding. And I might leave it there in case we have any questions. Yes. online for the tender alerts um, so you can do that as an individual the university also has an account where we get alerts that tell us what the what opportunities are coming through what tends to happen is one of two things either you can apply as an individual researcher or build a team of collaborators from the university or the tender is is, is put out to a specific group of universities itself so it might invite 10 universities from the GO8 and others to submit so sometimes it's structured in the way that particularly if it's if it's deemed to be research, but you can jump online indefinitely at state and federal level. You can get a, um, an alert that's sent to your email to deliver tenders. You'll get everything, as in pop, fix the pothole in King Street, you know, whatever it could be, but you can narrow your field so you can see when things that are specifically focused on research come up. For the library resources that you talked about, most of them seem to be Australia focused. Do you have any um, resources that uh, apply to other countries that you, we might be interested in researching? Um, we have access to lots of databases and services in different countries around the world wide. Um, but I haven't looked into um, beyond Australia in terms of sort of the not for profit um, public sector community organisation space. But I, I would certainly say that there would be equivalent websites to the ones that we've covered today for other countries. So yeah, if there's a particular um, country that you have in mind, just feel free to contact the librarian for your discipline or faculty and we can look into it for you as well. Maybe if it's a really great resource that would benefit a lot of people, we can think about subscribing to it in the long term as well. in this collaboration that you would set up with another person, another group that would fund your, or contribute to your research, to what extent would they dominate the results? I think that's what really bothers me, okay? You know, you've got a, a specific piece of research and you're really working hard on it, and if you would invite other people to um, fund it as well, they may want to change the outcome, no? So ideally what we have is the research collaboration is set up at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, so that, the, so that both in terms of funding and also the collaborating partners. So it would be unusual to bring in a partner after you've done a substantial amount of research and then want to divert that research into um, an alternative because you will have already formulated your methodology and how the research is going to be undertaken. Uh, sometimes particular funding agencies ask for particular requirements in terms of outputs, but if you're feeling like your research is being, you're being asked by a partner to push your research in terms of in one particular direction, what you're actually entering is the world of consultancy, which is not research. So, as a university academic, you are allowed to do consultancy under the universities, um, under your work at the university, but that's transactional, which is what I think you're talking about, where you're actually producing research for a particular outcome that's been commissioned or um, commissioned by an, another partner. You can do that, and lots of people do do that, um, but what we try and steer always back to is this being a research collaboration where the outcomes are, in fact, um, undefined at the time of the beginning of the research. So we don't actually know, rather than proving a particular point as a consultancy arrangement might want you to do. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? So this is a question about uh, category three funding. So category three funding, so in case 
Um, and there are a couple of foundations I've been in touch with, or also, um, let's say, governmental fundings from other countries, but they usually don't pay any overhead. Mm -hmm. So how is that uh, to be dealt with with the university? Because they would expect the university to arrange for offices, maybe library resources, computers, and uh, infrastructure, but they wouldn't pay any extra, let's say, overhead usually. Okay. These foundations. So when you're getting to the stage of putting together budgets for really significant research collaborations, or even really tiny ones, that the university asks you to include in there a 35% fee on top of the cost of the research itself. Um, often, and it's not just international agencies, domestic ones do this too, say that you cannot include any over overheads or indirect cost recovery. The way in which you can interpret the policy is if you are not allowed to include that in there, you don't have to include it in your budget because you aren't able to do that. But what you would need to do is speak to your local research support team and probably your head, either chair of department or your head of school to make sure that they're comfortable with the office, your time, all the other extra resources that might go into the research collaboration. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So before, before even probably moving much further with that conversation, I would make sure to get in contact with either your school-based um, um, research support officer um, and they can help you work through that because as you can imagine the university can't kind of extend beyond the money just coming through researchers that we have to recover costs for things like offices as well and as you know there's limited space so those can be really tricky things to negotiate so bringing in five postdocs on a particular grant might be of interest to you as a researcher but it may not be something that your school can accommodate well not all um, not all category funding outside category one um, exclude the indirect cost recovery. In fact, most don't. Some specific schemes don't allow it. The Australian Research Council doesn't allow it either. So even within category one. Um, so I'm not quite sure. All I really would recommend that you do is to make sure that the money that's coming in is going to reflect the whole term of the engagement in the research partnership and to make sure that the facilities are available before you sign up for it so that there isn't an expectation from the research collaborator that you're going to be able to host five postdocs, international postdocs, when in fact you can't. So I would, I would really encourage you to speak to your local research support officer. I don't know what each school or department or faculty has available um, in terms of office space, um, desks, computers and things, but make sure that you have that conversation at your local level to make sure that that can be accommodated before signing off on anything. Any other questions?